Hello, folks. Welcome to GDC 2021. This is the live fireside chat, Gina Davis and Mitu Kandaker on masculinity and video games in the gaming community. I'm Joel Couture, Editor-in-Chief of Indie Games Plus. My pronouns are he, him, and I'll be the moderator for this session. Uh, now I'd like to pass things over to Gina so she can introduce herself, you know, in case you somehow need an introduction for her and her tremendous amount of work in all kinds of media industries. So Gina, please take it away. Oh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, thanks for that. And uh, thanks for everybody for being here. I'm very excited to, to be a part of this today and um, very uh Excited to get going and talk about this uh, this topic that we've done a, a very extensive uh, study about. And uh, so, uh, yeah, looking forward to all of this. All right. And next we have Mitu. Could you say a few words about your own impressive body of work? Because uh, you're pretty impressive as well. Thanks, Joel. Um, yeah, just really honored to be here. So, hi, I'm Dr. Mitu Kandeka. Uh, I'm a game designer and engineer. Um, so I'm a professor at NYU Game Center, and I'm also C CEO at Glow Up Games, which is a, uh, a diverse mobile game studio. Um, and I've been in the games industry for around uh, 14 years now, so I've been coming to GDC for about that long as well. So really thrilled to be here to welcome Gina to her first GDC. Um, so I've been lucky as well to be on the um, the advisory committee for GDC for the last uh, six years or so on the advocacy side. So I'm here to represent the game developers perspective. Well, it's great to have you both here. Uh, I'm just gonna jump right in with some questions. So let's talk about this study. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the study and how everything worked, Gina? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, we, uh, we looked at both uh, the games themselves and also uh, the, uh, the players that uh, that people watch play uh, and uh, took a survey also to find out people's uh, impressions and and ideas about it. So this is a very very extensive study, and uh, we believe more extensive than any that's been done previously on uh, on gaming and what messages it sends. Okay, um, what sort of uh, specifics were you looking for in the study? Well. Uh, like, what did you, were you hoping to find from watching what people watch play? Well, we wanted to find out, uh, we wanted to find out what, uh, like I said, what message the the games are sending and, uh, and, and found particularly strong uh, results in what uh, the male characters represent uh, and uh, the, 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 uh, impact of, of violence and uh, hyper masculinity in uh in these uh in these games that are that are being played and uh and you know trying to see what kind of impact that has and how it can maybe be improved uh moving forward okay. um the study indicates that uh, many elements of the gaming eco ecosystem reinforce something called the man box can you tell us a little bit about what this man box entails because that was a that was a learning experience for me because I'd never heard this subject before. About right. Tales, right. how video games connect to it on many different levels, and how is this building a very specific vision of the world and what is acceptable behavior through interacting with the medium of games? So it's a mouthful. <laughs> right, right. So the man box um, is uh, the seven pillars of the man box is uh, a concept that was developed by our partners at Promundo, and it refers to a set of beliefs that are communicated by parents and family and the media and peers and other members of society uh, that place pressures on men and boys to be a certain way. Uh, and these pressures include uh, telling men to be self-sufficient, to act tough, to be physically attractive, to stick to very rigid gender roles, to be heterosexual, uh, to have sexual prowess, and to use aggression to resolve conflicts. And uh, we found in our study that Masculine norms are very strongly upheld uh, with four and five male characters displaying at least one of these pillars of masculinity, for example. Uh, seven to 10 male characters are shown engaging in stereotypically masculine activities like taking risks, engaging in violence, getting angry. Uh, nearly one in four male characters actually express anger and uh, violence is also a major component of this man box, 63% um, of male characters uh, enact violence 
in the in the uh, in the games and 84 percent of that time the violence is directed against other people and the leading motive for violence from male characters is personal gain compared to the small proportion of characters who are perpetrating violence for a more noble uh motivation protecting a stranger or protecting society this kind of uh alters like uh your players uh the the game players' visions on kind of what reality is or what is acceptable behavior through their kind of interactions with these games. Right. Yes. Hyper exposure to uh, to mm -hmm. these kinds of tropes is uh, is very impactful and will definitely, uh, uh, you know, what we what we're exposed to over and over becomes a, a sort of reality for us and uh, uh, media and games and and. Uh, um, the things that we see in our popular culture have a tremendous impact on shaping who we are. So uh, as you can imagine, watching, playing these games over and over or watching people play these games um, can have a significant impact about what you think is, is the actual uh, way that men should be, what masculinity yeah. should look like. Yeah, exactly. Seeing these kind of reinforced from like hearing with the, the boys hangouts seeing them reinforced in the games they're playing can kind of feed into this is this is right this is real this is how people talk and act to each other right right to your point um me too i want to bug you um can you suggest some ways uh no matter how small to kind of break away from these man box elements in game development or how developers can kind of steer away from that yeah, I mean, I think firstly, to speak to that, like this is the first time I was lucky enough to sort of get a peek at the study ahead of time. And I think um, firstly, to speak to the man box, like I think the thing I love about um, the that definition is the way that it talks about how it is limiting, right, for, mm -hmm. for, for both cis men and folks of all genders, right? So like the ways in which um, these representations kind of box people in. Um, in certain ways. Um, and I think the other thing as well, um, before I sort of get to your question directly, is that that, uh, that I love about the study is that it is very intersectional and that's something I care a lot about. So there's a lot of, um, um, in addition to sort of looking at gender representation, um, it's also sort of, uh, you know, there's some groundbreaking sort of new findings through the content ana analysis uh, to do with uh, race representation, to do with queer representation, and like looking across all of these different intersecting axes, which is a really important perspective to take. Um, and so, um, and those are sort of all things that we should be thinking of kind of together as game developers, like, you know, taking this very intersectional approach. Um, I think, you know, to, to, to speak to sort of ways that we can um, intervene in these kinds of representations, um, I think it's like several fold, right, as these things often are, because you look at this sort of, um, I think I have like, you know, three distinct sort of ways that I think about this, because firstly, there's the business perspective, right? And if we're looking at, because I know the study looked at sort of the, um, the top five streamers and what games they're playing. And so the reasons for, um, and often those are sort of AAA games, et cetera. And the reasons why um, those games are often sort of perpetrating uh, these types of, uh, you know, these types of tropes, et cetera, is because, you know, the games industry, as we know, um, we sort of, uh, it's very, like most designs are very sort of iterative, right? Like we take sort of what's worked before and innovate on it slightly because, you know, games are kind of making games is inherently risky in a lot of ways. It's financially risky. It's also really, really hard, right? Like, as we know, as game developers, um, you know, games can run into all kinds of, you know, it's just a inherently uh, tricky sort of technical and design sort of undertaking anytime you're making a game. And so often the things that, you know, so innovation can, can often be difficult. Um, you know, in that context, um, especially, so, so I think the thing I'm getting to is that it really takes uh, studios to hold values around wanting to break free of these tropes, right? It really does need to come from, um, on the, from the business perspective, studio leadership wanting to really take a stance and, uh, and, and, you know, and innovate on these types of representations. And part of that as well is, you know, something I'll get to again more is like, who is, who is in positions of decision-making? 
around uh, what what goes into a game, right? Like who is being represented? Because as we know, often it is, uh, you know, over, the games industry is overwhelmingly represented in leadership positions by cis white men um, and cis white straight men. So we need to disrupt that. Um, and the last thing I'll say, I think from a design perspective, you know, it's, it's not that... It's not that um, we don't have ways uh, to, uh, to to think about better representation because there are plenty of developers out there who are doing that work. And often those are folks from marginalized backgrounds themselves who um, have perhaps, you know, smaller studios or they're doing work by themselves or in like tiny teams, but they need the opportunity to sort of have funding to really have their ideas pushed forward. So we need to sort of, you know, this is a wide ranging problem and it's a structural problem that we need to disrupt. I definitely agree that uh, this goes all the way through every level of like game development, like it requires management to take a lead on this, it requires like uh, people in like, your position in like leadership positions to take care of things, handle things much better than they're, they've been handled before. And it tells different stories and it shows different types of like gameplay elements and risks. And, and like, yeah, yeah, it's risky, but like it also will broaden what this uh, industry can do and say by like reaching out to folks who aren't normally represented here. Um, Gina, I want to bug you about some more stuff. Uh, what trends are you seeing in kind of the characters represented in video games? You talked, you touched on it a little bit, but uh sort of in who gets represented and how they're being represented. Right, right. So uh, male characters outnumbered female characters four to one and white characters outnumbered characters of color three to one. Uh, unfortunately, LGBTQ disabled and large body type characters are nearly non-existent. Um, white male characters are twice as likely to carry a weapon as male characters of color and are, are much more likely to be violent, uh, particularly carrying a gun. Um, and then when we look at the top 20 streamers, uh, they are all men. Uh, only one is a man of color and only one identifies as LGBTQ. And uh, there's often 10% uh, of uh, streamers use homophobic or transphobic language, or, or uh, that language appears in about 10% of uh, segments, uh, no disabled characters, um, and then uh, streamers often use ableist language in nearly half of the gameplay segments, uh, like some kind of variation of the ableist language, crazy in one in five game segments. Um, so uh, so there's, there's just a lot of that sort of, uh, negative stereotyping um, and uh, uh, and violence and hypermasculinity going on in the in the in the characters that are being played. And, uh, you've also touched on uh, what's the study revealed about the sexualization of women as well, because that was another thing that comes up quite frequently. Oh, yes. Well, yes, uh, there, there's definitely of the few female characters there are. They are uh, they are tremendously uh, uh, sexualized, hypersexualized, and uh, uh, you know this also has a tremendous impact on uh, both uh, the concept of women feeling comfortable to to join in and play these same games, and uh, and how um, women are viewed from a sort of hypermasculine lens that um, that sees them more as uh, sex objects rather than um, than uh, equal partners. Female characters are ten more, ten times more likely to be shown in revealing clothing than male characters. Yeah, it's definitely a, a large problem. Um, what effect are we feeling this is having on the audience receiving the game? I imagine it's similar to what violence that, that effect has on, like the males who are receiving these games. That's open up, kind of open to both of you. Um, I mean, I can feel that one, um, you know, in terms of, you know, just the experience, we know across like all kinds of media, and this is obviously, you know, this is why it's so exciting to have Gina here to like talk about this, because obviously the work that you've done across like uh, other other sort of types of media representation also shows this, like representation matters. We know that. Um, I've felt that in my own life, um, you know, being a, being a little brown girl growing up playing video games from as long as I can remember, um, you know, you sort of learn, and especially, you know, and, and you know, this, this is why I was, as I was saying, like intersectionality is important. We need to look at gender representation together with race representation, because often, um, you know, for someone in my position, like for instance, taking 
I don't know, like Street Fighter as an example, just because I remember playing it when I was young and, you know, um, seeing the uh, that, that classic dilemma that I think a lot of us faced of like, oh, do we, uh, are we the female character? Are we Chen Li? Or in my case, like, you know, am I am I Dal Sim? Like the, the one, like, you know, the, the Indian character, which is like not great representation, right? And so it's like, oh, who is like close enough to... Um, you know, how I feel like I'm represented. And I think the thing that I, I, I often say about this is I actually, even though I was making those decisions, it didn't actually hit me for the longest time that that was a decision I was making. Like I didn't, when I was like young and even in my teens often like playing video games, I wasn't like, oh, you know, if only I could see myself because that wasn't even represented as, I wasn't presented to me as an option, right? And so when you're sort of taught over and over that you're not gonna be represented, you sort of internalize like, oh, maybe I'm not, maybe I don't deserve to be represented. And that is sort of this, uh, really, you know, it's, it's something that a lot of us carry and it's, a, it's in the work that I'm now doing um, through my company Glow Up, where we're explicitly setting out to, to rectify that, you know, like myself and my co-founder, Latoya Peterson, you know, as, as, uh, as women and women of color, we, you know, we think about this a lot, like we've had these experiences and so that's why we want to, you know, we want to do better. Yeah, yeah, I think it's important to be able to kind of see yourselves in these play experiences and it's important for the cis males to also see other people out in the world like it's it's gives you this uh this closed worldview to see no one but the same white males doing the same white male fantasy power fantasies all the time so they're they're limited in kind of what they they even accept of the world or see of the world they don't see that these people even exist out there so um i kind of want to ask from the development side me too um how does this affect uh, developers who are like de creating these kind of like sexualized versions of women or like these like nasty stereotypes and things like that? Because I feel that must have an effect on like a development team who spends months and years like crafting like something, frankly, gross. <laughs> well, I mean, I think the one thing I want to speak to is um, the experience of marginalized folks at these companies, right? So whether you're women um, or, you know, non-binary or, you know, from, from any other marginalized access, underrepresented access within games, um, often, you know, folks do want to be, um, especially if you're on a big team where you don't have that decision-making power, like, you know, this is, this is, none of this is stuff that developers don't already know, right? But what will often happen is, folks in leadership positions will, um, you know, will, will, will just, you know, like cut, uh, so, you know, even if you, I've, I've got just countless stories of, of friends, et cetera, who've worked on games where, um, you know, you start, you start including more diverse representation, but then as soon as, as games often do, as I said, making games is hard. So they come into, you know, you run up against time and budget and all these things. And often because of the values of folks in leadership positions, the first thing to get cut is those diverse representations. And I think that is the thing that has the effect on, on, on folks um, because they're being told like, oh, your experiences don't matter. We can also take that further, right? Like today is, um, as we were talking about a little bit before this, Joel, like today is a really interesting day to be having this discussion um, because, you know, as, as Bloomberg reported, um, the, uh, the lawsuit by the state of California against Activ Activision Blizzard um, for the sort of alleged, you know, as, as they call it, the frat boy culture um, within, within that space, um, like... <laughs> The experience of being a, a marginalized person within games is often a traumatic one. Um, and that's something that we also need to rectify. Definitely. And if if you're thinking of reading this in the audience, like looking at the uh, the articles in the uh, the lawsuit, um, please, please take care of yourself. It is probably one of the most awful ones I've read in a good long time in this industry. So please take care before you read it. All right. Uh, let me just shift over a little bit. Um, the findings in the study indicated popular stream games often promote hypermasculinity through violence or personal gain and aggression, like you said earlier. Um, do we have any suggestions for developers on how to better frame their game experiences to move away from this, better shape their characters to move away from this behavior, even if like, violence is kind of the focus of the game? Right. Well, uh, 
it would be important, I think, for developers to consider examining, do the male characters have to be aggressive all the time uh, and repress their emotions and to fight any time they feel threatened, uh, which then results in more violence and more risky behavior. Um, you know, uh, perhaps they can think about um, what are ways that the characters can face these challenges in the game uh, more creatively? What other more creative and mentally challenging ways can they address these problems or more clever things that the characters can do rather than just uh, shooting guns? Um, and, and therefore, uh, you know, acknowledge that they have a role to play uh, in reinforcing positive ideas of manhood. Uh, and uh, and I, I think that's very important. Um, to jump in on that as well, yeah, um, I think, <laughs> uh, sorry, I guess that's what you're gonna ask. Uh, no, I mean, I think that, I think that um, you know, the, there is such a rich landscape of uh, types of uh, of types of game design that you know have yet to be have yet to be explored and to be funded as well because these are types of things that you know like lots of designers I know um, have have sort of experimented with etc. Like looking at ideas of vulnerability right um, among male characters like looking at um, there was a wonderful talk uh, by uh, the developer Brie Code a couple of years ago at GDC about sort of tendon befriend mechanics in games um, so like that's what that's that's an area where there, there, there are folks doing work, but you know, we need we need those ideas to be sort of like given the platform and and you know that those ideas to be pushed further. So I think that um, yeah, and to speak to what Gina was saying about you know what other actions can there be um, as a as a game design teacher. So when I teach game design at NYU, you know, one of the lenses we have for thinking about um, game design is thinking about um, verbs that characters have, right? Like or, or um, that you can do as a player. Player. So what are the verbs that, uh, you know, like actions, like doing words that characters or, or the player is able to enact within a game that aren't necessarily just, um, you know, combat related. Um, so there's, you know, the, and there's, there's, yeah, there's all kinds of things that uh, that we can be sort of exploring further through games for sure. Um, you know, the idea of like friendship mechanics, the idea of yeah, uh, the, uh, you know, just exploring, exploring more vulnerability. Um, and I think, you know, part of the, part of that uh, is also um, thinking about like pro-social design, right? So a lot of game design is often competitive or a lot of games, you know, in terms of the sort of subset of games we're talking about, there's, um, you know, like competitive, uh, competitive gameplay versus like thinking about like, oh, how do you design for sort of more um, pro-social interactions between players? Like how does the game design actually help bring that about um, and reward those kinds of behaviors? So I think that's kind of what I found really interesting about the study is that it points to the sort of necessity of creating these spaces for, for, um, uh, for you know, players of all genders really, but especially for those who are sort of affected by this, like or limited by this man box idea. Yeah, there's definitely some proof out there that shows like uh, different experiences in games, like not the hardcore, pure, violent shooter is like, they're not the most popular things. They're still immensely popular, don't get me wrong. But these other experiences that push us to be more social or that can uh, bring a little bit of fun together, less focus on like harming other human beings and like more and different styles of stories are starting to gain a lot of like power or Power may not be the best word, but they're getting their audience. They're getting their audience. People are seeing them and they're starting to be made. Like the, there is some different stuff finally coming out there. Yeah, there was some wonderful stuff. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier, Joel, about the um, the IGF awards last night, right? So we can see uh, within that space, the sort of plethora of interesting, like new types of games that um, that that are popular and that have, uh, that that, you know, that are being made, of course. Yeah, and uh, the talk about community kind of like brings me to my next uh, my next question for you, gang. Um, research has indicated that many males find game to be a connection with peers and community. Like, so even we're seeing it there. Like, they're finding there's a connection with those Twitch streamers or with their friends. So, and they're also saying, according to your study, Gina, that it's a place that can be their true selves. Um, gaming also seems to connect these players with to make damaging stereotypes and visions of masculinity. So. What sort of work do we feel game developers can do in trying to use this feeling of connection and community to build something more positive, like build on that natural, like that desire to be together, but like if this, like, and to build a better true self? 
Right, right. Well, we we found uh, a tremendous evidence uh, for how important the the connection with with peers and friends and community is to people who game. Uh, our survey showed that. Um, the uh, in the gaming culture, 91% of boys and 86% of men say that playing video games is a way, an important for way, way for them to connect with their male friends. Uh, but unfortunately, young gamers <clears throat> experience a tremendous amount of bullying and, har and harassment in online gaming. And uh, older respondents uh, said they routinely witness homophobia and racism in online gaming. So uh, the the culture is providing valuable human connection and there's certainly a space to do that. But the ongoing concern is that the culture often normalizes violence and hate. And so the thing to think about is since there's such a positive aspect that you can gain from developing community and sharing time, a special time with your friends uh, through gaming, how can we make it a more positive experience and, uh, and subject you to less uh, bullying, harassment, and uh, and violence. There has to be positive things that um, <clears throat> ways to make the experience more positive and and creative. And uh, you know, we know that what happens in the fictional world, fictional world, does have a real life impact. And uh, the online gaming provides incredibly important opportunities for boys and young men to connect. But uh, you know we need to we need to make it so, as as you said, they they can feel like they're uh, being their true selves online and not having to reinforce toxic uh, prejudices and toxic masculinity. Yeah, your study you brought up that they mentioned true self came up a lot. I wonder how much true self is. Um, I, 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 this is me without rules. Not this is is this who I really am, or is this who I am when the boys all want to be bad and I want to be bad together? Like, does it just feed that kind of nature, and do the males just kind of assume that's their true self because this is what I am without rules? And when well, I thinks of me, like I, I, I know what you're saying. This is just sorry. me. <laughs> this is just me speculating, but but. Mm -hmm. uh, but you do have to wonder, can, can they be their true selves when there's so much emphasis on being hyper-masculine and, um, and embracing violence? Uh, you know, is, is some of it posturing, especially with young boys, you know, um, are they really feeling that or is that, or do they have to effort, emphasize hyper-masculinity in order to feel like they belong? Yeah, it's definitely, a, it's definitely a problem. And I mean, like you said, with the bullying being an issue and all the homophobia and slurs getting thrown around like are you, are you being your true self or have you been kind of cowed into this position so it's feeding a lot of like negative stereotypes to your point all right. um, so I think I think just just to jump in on that as well um <laughs> it seems like you know one of the things that the study um you know it seems to point to is like yeah just these spaces being opportunities for um for male identifying folks um and cis men especially like being being able to connect right and you know and i want and and to some extent it's because like the parameters that the rest of society has set is like oh these are the ways in which you like number one can connect um you know in this in this like very limited kind of in this very limited kind of way so that's kind of one part of it like oh if, if there's sort of if there are sort of other types of um sort of uh like more pro-social environments which you know which and this is like this is beyond a games problem right because this is again like this is what the this is like a societal problem writ large as we know as many things are um so i think that's that's sort of one part of it the um, the other thing that I thought was really interesting about like the study to speak to that kind of power fantasy element of games uh, is, and I think you touched on this earlier, Gina, when you said um, that in terms of sort of representations of like aggression, et cetera, um, it's white male protagonists who are enacting those without, um, without sort of like other reasons. And I think one of the things that I found interesting about the study is looking at like, oh, when there are characters of color who are also being, um, you know, being violent in some way or being aggressive in some way, often it's for this like larger social good, which is sort of like a trope in itself, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's just interesting. Like, I just thought that was an interesting finding uh, from the study. Mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. Yeah. 
little piece that came out of it. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Me no, I was just going to say, it, it, I, I did find it very interesting that that uh, uh, white characters were so much more violent than than uh, characters of color. Um, it's not like we say, hey, let's make it equal. <laughs> let's get the characters of color more violent. It's, let's get the white characters less violent. All right. Um, so I know we're kind of we're, we're heading towards the talk about management, but I want to ask and maybe this is an unfair to ask me too, but um, what do you feel that individuals working at game development companies, like all the way down the ladder can push and do to help offer, like work for better representation and deter toxicity, sexism, all those things. And I mean, we've seen, again, those gross allegations go all the way up the ladder. We've talked about how it's, that change really needs to come from up top. But I mean, what can your white guy in the office do? Like, we need to do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> yes. Oof, again, what a day to be. Yeah, I think this is, question. I think we need um, to talk about it today. <laughs> absolutely. And, you know, and I think that um, firstly, you know, just reiterating that ultimately this, these problems go up to leadership, right? Like that is ultimately like, it's these things start from the top. So companies and leaders need to have values where they care about these issues. And often, you know, and, and the way that I look at it, and often, yeah, it's it, it can be complex as well, because it's not to say that uh, folks from marginalized backgrounds can't also, you know, if they've bought into these hegemonic ideas, they can't also perpetrate this. But I think, you know, it really does come from a question of values from the top, because that's also like who gets you listened to at the company. Company, who gets supported at the company? What is the overall culture at the company? And um, so that's definitely one part of it. In terms of sort of every, like, you know, just uh, folks who are not uh, in leadership positions necessarily, I mean, firstly, you know, the, we as an industry need to support marginalized folks being able to get to leadership positions because it's not just a pipeline problem. This is what I say. And, you know, I'm, I, I'm lucky enough to be like a, um, a, an if then STEM ambassador, like I do all kinds of work to sort of help get more folks into the industry. But the biggest problem is that once they're there, they're not being supported um, and, and able to stay. And that's because they're not, you know, it's at the at the at the least worst end of the spectrum. It's because they're not being listened to, and as we've seen in the worst end of the spectrum, it's you know stuff like what's coming out in the allegations, um, which is like just uh, sort of the tip of the iceberg in a lot of ways in terms of like the what really is going on. So, um, one of the last thing I'll say about that is that it is incumbent upon allies. Um, often like cis white men allies to step up and like intervene when they see these things happen. Um, and the, like, you know, there's all kinds of things that can be said about that, but you know, it's also not on the burden shouldn't be on marginalized folks to drive the change. And often it is us who is doing it. So that's kind of, you know, that's another thing where again, like who gets listened to, where is the locus of power in the industry? So that's something we need to disrupt. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of uh, marginalized folks literally just thrown to the wolves for uh, a claim of diversity when it's nothing is actually changing in management. And exactly. I, maybe I'm just speculating on this point, but perhaps some of that uh, that community um, feeling of could be of value because, like, you know, to your point, like the males feel there's a sense of community in working with that. But there's the people in power who cause these errors feel they're all right in it. I mean, this this is again, this is just my speculation. So meeting those walls of like their their peers saying, "Hey, no, this isn't all right. What you're doing," um, uses that sense of community in games to show them, "No, this behavior is not acceptable." Because when we're silent, I think everything's fine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. So me too. You smash through my next connect question. Oh, sorry. So, no, no, it was perfect. It's like, shoot, I, you're, you're doubling up on my questions. All right. Um, I got another one on, let's say, like the, the platform holders for like Twitch and that. Not not just Twitch just came first in mind. It's not the one I'm specifically calling out, but like streaming platform holders. Um, do we feel they have some responsibility and who kind of who gets pushed to the front as their popular streamers and, you know, what we can kind of work with there? Um Gina, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, so, so say it say it again. Sorry, I phrased that really funny. Oh, no, um, this, do we wonder if streamers, uh, like stream platform holders, like uh, what the where you were getting your your footage for your study, um, if they have some responsibility, they could possibly work or tools they could possibly work with to kind of 
promotes more uh, positive representation? Well, uh, well, right. They would have to be. Uh, they would have to be creative about it. In, in other words, they would have to sort of. Uh, maybe talk about the limitations they feel the game has, or maybe, you know, it'd be helpful if they talked about um, ways that they could creatively think of, of uh, changing, uh, getting away from as much violence and getting more creativity and cooperation in the games and um, less, uh, less stereotyping and hyper-masculinity. Um, I mean, they're certainly incredible influencers. So it seems like they should be part of the conversation if they would like to help um, impact the industry. Um, and to, yeah, so to jump in <laughs> on that as well. Um, yeah, I think if your question is like, is is do platform holders have responsibility to ch shift the picture of representation in the industry? I, my answer is absolutely yes. Um, you know, doing more, and you know, some platforms are starting to do this and certainly the conversations around like race that started last summer uh definitely like pushed more of these platform holders to sort of have those conversations and and push uh push marginalized folks um uh in terms of uh you know in terms of like who gets featured etc um but yeah like shout out like you know, we exist. Like, there's, you know, there's, there's plenty of streamers out there from, from, you know, from diverse backgrounds. And I want to shout out to um, communities like Black Girl Gamers, uh, Brown Girl Gamer Code, um, you know, the Noir Network. Like, there are just, you know, there are communities uh, where, you know, you can find all kinds of, you know, all kinds of other voices to to profile and to sort of give a platform to. And yes, like, if we want a wider system change that is like a really key part of it it's vital for those platform holders to take a, take a hand in it um do you know do you feel there's any aspect of the the study i haven't touched on that you kind of wanted to like push forward or talk about no you gosh you've covered a you've covered a lot of it uh, <laughs> yeah you've done an excellent job so far yeah uh i can't think i'm sure i hadn't missed any important kind of elements of it right um Right. So, um, is the study going to become uh, available publicly anytime soon? Yes, it is. It's uh, it's available on our website, which is cjane.org. S e e j a n e dot org. Yes. And it I've, just got released today, right? Yes. Yes. Which is exciting. So. Uh, yes. Like I said, I got to have a sneak peek at it. Um, so yeah, excited for other folks to to see it as well. Yeah, it's very exciting. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there any, has anyone been requesting the study or like, uh, I guess what, what's your next step from here? Uh, well, uh, do events like this promote it and, uh, and, uh, mm -hmm. bring it to attention, uh, you know, hopefully be in some articles about mm -hmm. it and, uh, um, you know, move forward. Uh, you know, we really value our relationship, our partnership with Promundo. So we can intend to keep working with them on, on this type of thing and see if we can make some progress. Sounds great. Um, so, so for we're really looking at kind of management as being uh, a central issue here. So, um, and we're pushing. We would like to see more marginalized people in uh, positions of management. Um, this is a difficult question to ask, but um, how do we think that can happen? And like, is there ways we can see the industry like? like the, the bigger giants in the industry, like help make that change? So I think from my perspective, um, it's, you know, it, it's multi, it's, there's multiple facets to it, right? Um, as I was saying before, it's creating environments where marginalized folks are not leaking out of the industry, right? Like there is a huge leaky bucket problem, as we call it. Um, uh, there's the old adage that um, within games, if you've if you've had a career longer than five years, you're deemed a veteran because the, the dropout rate from the industry is, is so high. It's, it's, it's high for anybody because, you know, there's such a like burnout culture in, in many ways, but then that's especially true, um, you know, for marginalized folks. So that aspect, absolutely, like allowing folks to survive in the industry long enough and thrive, you know, let's just not survive. Let's like, let's create conditions for people uh, from marginalized backgrounds to thrive in the industry. 
um, such that they can reach these positions of, of leadership and management. So that's definitely one of them. And I think secondly, um, in terms of, because you know, one of the things that I'm lucky enough to see um, through the work I do as an educator um, and just, you know, just being able to, um, uh, so shout out to organizations like Game Devs of Color, um, where, you know, there are lots of um, sort of up and coming marginalized devs who like have like amazing games and amazing ideas, et cetera, but they need access to resources and funding. And that is something that needs to also come from the top, because one of the things that we see um, is in terms of like indie studios that get formed, often the ones that get funded are the ones who've come out of the big Activision blizzards and the riots and like all of these other places. So allowing access to funds for folks um, from, you know, from more kinds of backgrounds is, is going to be super important. Are there any good sources of funding that exist now that you're aware of? Uh, sources of funding? Yeah. Um, so, uh, well, it's uh, you know this is this is something I could definitely speak to, but um, you know, there's I do want to shout out uh, to uh, things like Wings Fund, uh, which is something that I'm you know on the on the um, on the advisory board for as well, which is a fund specifically funding um, uh, folks from marginalized backgrounds and marginalized genders. Um, there's also um, shout out to Galaxy Fund, which is uh, run by some of the folks who started Glitch. Um, uh, which is another sort of newer um, sort of source of funding who are very interested in sort of pushing forward the landscape for, for underrepresented developers as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, there's just not enough. And that's the thing. And we need to, you know, disrupt like who uh, from more traditional sources of funding, because like, again, those organizations that I shouted out to, it's marginalized folks setting those up often, right? So, you know, but we need, uh, we need people who are in existing sort of, you know, seats of power within the industry to, to also, um, you know, make those changes and hold those values. Yeah, it's definitely, like we keep saying, it comes from up top. Um, not that, oh, I'm barely hearing things. <laughs> All right. Um, you two are too quick. You literally burned through <laughs> three prepared questions. So we are in uncharted territory here. Uh, um, you, Gina, I, I noticed in your study that there has been a little bit of growth over the years. You noticed between your study and I think there was another one done. What was it, ten years ago, or it was it was quite a bit older? Oh, that we did, or, or uh, yeah, or at least the, some of the numbers have gone up very slightly, but they have gone. There has been some positive change. Oh, some positive change. Uh, yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah, <laughs> I don't have I don't have the old numbers uh, in front of me, but uh, but uh, yeah, you know uh, uh, the change is, is too uh, is too glacial. You know, obviously at this point, this has been. I mean, we could have said all this about games ten and twenty years ago. The same problems uh, showing themselves. So um, it just it needs a. Uh, I guess it needs just needs some enthusiasm to rethink this and see how how can we really make it uh, a more positive uh, influence on society, you know, and uh, uh, and make it even more fun and more interesting and challenging and uh, and uh, uh, a place to feel uh, not only welcome but more supported and safe and um, inclusive. Yeah. So we're seeing any sort of like little, like to Gina's point, glacial changes in positivity and treatments of like marginalized folks and? Well, um, there's, uh, yeah, I mean, Yes, things are things are definitely moving forward. Um, you know, there there are more. Um, again, you know, there's more marginalized folks coming into the industry than ever before. But again, you know, reiterating, we need to create the systems of support to be able to keep them there. Um, there's the work that we're obviously doing you know, at Glow Up Games, which is mm -hmm. uh, you know just a, a, a we're a, we're proud to be like a really diverse studio ourselves. Like I said, um, so and you know we've we fought hard to get there as 
well. Um, we're, uh, I think, the first the first um, studio of our kind, like the first all women of color founded mobile game studio to have uh, raised over a million dollars in seed funding. Um, so you know, there's 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 ch change is is happening slowly. Just we've got a there's a lot of fighting to do to get there, and that's something that you know so many of us are working are working to change. Yeah, I didn't want to imply that there was a we're good now because things are doing great now. We're getting slightly better, but no, like it, it's to Gina's point again, the, the change is glacial that we're seeing. And, and yeah. as we're seeing in places like the allegations that Activision Blizzard, uh, yeah. it's not actually happening probably at all. So there's a lot of bad stuff that kind of needs to get dealt with at the moment. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I have, oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I was going to say that uh, I, I would also encourage uh, people in the industry and creators to uh, to use our research. You know, it's available to everyone and um, has some valuable insights in there for everybody. So I think it'd be important for uh, for the community to look at that. Um, I have a question for Gina, actually, um, if I may. Um, so I'm curious because you do so much great work in sort of other types of media and film and TV around representation. Um, what are the sort of similarities you're seeing? Um, and what are the sort of differences you're seeing between those spaces and, you know, as you've uh, sort of set your foot in, in looking at this in the games industry as well? Right. Well, uh, yeah, our, our, our first, um, uh, the reason why I started the Institute and the, and the, and the original uh, object was to impact on-screen character representation and what kids see, uh, because I felt that um, there were some uh, negative messages coming through, especially about uh, females and, you know, a, a profound lack of female characters in what was made for little kids and why are we teaching children to have unconscious bias from the beginning? Um, so, uh, and we've had some some really uh, very good success in making a difference in the 15 years that we've been doing it. Um, and, uh, uh, and it's really been through the research. The research has had the most impact for us in that a lot of times people aren't aware uh, fully of what they're making. You know, they 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 uh, they see it one way, but where the research shows that it's actually another way. So um, <clears throat> so just learning about what they're actually showing helps them realize they need to make a change. And so uh, we can hope that the research will inspire change in the same way <clears throat> sorry, in the gaming industry, where they say, wow, we didn't realize that that, that was the case and uh, how poor our representation is of uh, people of color and uh, with disabilities and uh, LGBTQIA+. So let's try making some changes. So, I mean, that that is a hopeful outcome for this. Yeah, are some difficulties coming up for, well, I imagine there are, with uh, uh, showing people and having them face what uh, these unconscious biases. Right, right. It's a it's an incredible pro, uh, uh, you know, a, a powerful, incredibly powerful unconscious biases um, where uh, you you literally can't see what it is you're making. Um, and uh, uh, it was um, uh, it was so eye opening to people when we had. Uh, I mean, I suspected that that people weren't adding female characters because they didn't realize that they weren't including enough female characters. They thought they were doing right by girls and, uh, uh, but pointing it out to them and helping them see what they're actually making made all the difference. And we've actually now, the most exciting uh, goal that we've achieved is that uh, lead characters uh, being, uh, for lead characters in both children's television and movies made for children, we've now achieved parity uh, between the male and female lead characters. So this is monumental. It's ne never happened before. And uh, um, it's a huge change since we started 15 years ago. So um, so dramatic progress can be made. Uh, people just have to be aware that it needs to be made. Yeah, I, I, I love that because, um, you know, to speak to one of the reasons why um, why I started mm. Blow Up Games, my company, um, is, you know, feeling simultaneously inspired by, but then frustrated by the positive state changes that we were seeing in like film and TV um, with creators of color taking the helm more and more and more creators of color starting their own production companies and being able to get like have those opportunities, but then realizing like, oh, like that same change just isn't 
happening in the games industry. And so wanting to really sort of step up and, and you know, try and bring that change into effect. So, um, yeah, you know, for, for example, um, you know, creators like Issa Rae, um, who, you know, and we're at Glow Up, uh, full disclosure, we're, we're working on a tie-in game for her hit TV show, Insecure. Um, so, you know, just, but, but that to, to, to us, like, speaks to, um, that difference, right, between like the changes as you, you're saying, you know, that have happened in, you know, in film and TV, etc. But you know, the, the the games industry basically just has a long way to go. Gina, we really appreciate uh, the work you put into giving us some hard data to show the developers, like that this this needs to move, this needs to change. These are the this is the ugly truth on paper. Like these are the actual numbers and percentages. It's undeniable. So right. Thank you us for putting in that work. Well, yeah, and that's our goal is to take uh, is to take our study to uh, all the leading game developers and, and companies to share it with them uh, mm -hmm. uh, privately and and uh, see what see what we can encourage to happen. Okay. Uh, I want to thank you both for coming out, and uh, this was a fantastic talk, and I think an important time for it. Uh, Gina, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much as well for coming out. If you have anything in closing to say to the audience, I mean, feel free. Uh, no, just that I love gaming. I, I Every day, every day I play games far too long. <laughs> People say, oh, you're so busy. I'm like, really? Is that why I have uh, such a high score on uh, Candy Crush? So uh, it's... Uh, it's uh, you definitely uh, probably have mine beat. Yeah, I uh, yeah, I, I love I love playing games, and uh, it's important to me. And so, uh, so this is all really fun and uh, and important to me. And I I have two boys, uh, teenage boys. So uh, yeah, it's all very important to me. Yeah, and I think that's the vital thing. We all love games, and we want them to be better. That's 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 really what we're asking for at the end of the day. What we're what. Folks, you, folks, me too, and Gina, you're trying to do here. And I think that's, I think that's fantastic. Yeah, thank you. So again, thank you so much for coming for uh, coming out today and have this talk. Um, thank you to the GDC audience for uh, watching us. Um, and please enjoy the rest of your show. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Gina. Great to have you at your first GDC. Thank you, me too. Thank you. All right. Take care.